All right, 24-7 Hockey. I'm here today with Pat Fershweiler, assistant coach for the Detroit Red Wings. So what we're going to do here is we're really just going to dive in to, I've got a list of questions here that are going to hopefully help you understand, you know, what the mindset is of an NHL coach. Also, Pat has had experience coaching at the Division I level. He's had experience as a hockey director and as a coach at the AAA level and as an elite player himself. So really, Pat, we've got this entire range of experience that you can draw on because, you know, I think it's so interesting to look at your AAA experience and then come up, bring that all the way through to Division I to the NHL. And I mean, talk about someone who's got the knowledge base that, you know, some of these kids that are in high school, you can really relate to. All right. You know, I've seen it at every level, you know. Yeah, and it's it's because it's happened fairly quickly for me, Zach. And certainly, I've been lucky to uh, you know get the opportunities I've got. But the kids, some of the kids um, at the AAA level when I was coaching, are now young NHL players. So yep. I've seen the transition. I've followed them right up through college and kind of into the NHL on their time frame. So it's uh, the Brandon Sods of the world. These kind of guys, Vince Trocheck watch these guys as young uh, players, and then now I've watched them mature into real nice NHL players. That's awesome. Well, I really want to dive in here because I think that, you know, your experience and then also just, you know, the players that you've developed and, the, and the, you know, the progression that you've seen happen there can be really valuable. Right. Um, and, you know, like I was talking to you, what we're doing here at 24-7 Hockey is just, you know, really trying to provide the kids that are serious and dedicated about, you know, wanting to reach their goals, wanting to play at the next level. I mean, it's kind of funny. Like everyone says, hey, I want to play in the NHL, but there's kids that are out there. You know, there's going to be NHL players out of these 15, 16, 17 year olds, you know, and there's kids that are out there that are spending hours and hours and hours working at it. So, you know, let's make sure they're working on the right things. A hundred percent. And I, I think it's all our goals to make the National Hockey League. It certainly was my goal as a player. And I, I think I worked as hard as I possibly could and I didn't make it, but then I get to leave the game with no regrets. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, how do you get to the NHL? I think would be the first thing kids want to know. And I would say, be great at the level you're at. Yeah. Don't, don't look to a next level, wherever mm -hmm. you're at, treat it like your NHL, be great there, be as good as you can work as hard as you can and listen, uh, to try to get better every day. And if you do those things, the next level will notice. Then you get to the next level. And, and one by one, you can move up those levels. You can't look to the NHL. That's unrealistic from wherever you're at. Your, your goal should be to be great where you're at and then to, to somehow achieve the next level. Yep, yep. So when you say being great where you're at, I agree with that. Would you agree that, you know, when you see a kid, you know, there's kids that can play really well at one level but they're just kind of missing that something. So when they, they don't make it to the next level, you know, um, again, just kind of tying back into my experience in the USHL, I'll go recruit kids and I would, you know, scout kids. And we'd look at kids that were, you know, leading scorers or top defensemen, but they were just missing a little bit of these things that, you know, they were getting passed up. What do you think makes that, that kind of differentiator with a kid who can move on to the next level? We talk um, in college, we talk lots about it, and we talk about it a lot here is transferable skill sets. Mm -hmm. So what makes a successful player? I, I think the number one limiting uh, skill from one level to the next is skating. So if I'm a young player, I'm going to be the best possible skater I can be. Mm -hmm. And that's because I think that's the number one limiting factor to success at the next level. The game is so fast. Mm -hmm. It's played at such a high pace. Um, you know, Can I skate? Am I able to even function at that speed? Um, that, that's the number one thing I would work on as a young player, be a great, great skater. Okay. And, uh, and I, like we talk about a lot of skating here at 24 seven hockey. And the one thing I like about players that work on their skating and work to become a, a great skater is coaches and scouts notice that like, it's going to give you that second look, no matter what else happens. Like if you're out there and you're one of the best skaters, you're going to get that second, third look, you know? A hundred percent. I say skating buys you opportunities. Yep. You know, it buys you opportunities to, they say, well, okay, well may, maybe he's not a great thinker, but he's so fast. Can he kill penalties? Can he, can he uh, be an energy guy in our team? It gives you the opportunity to get more opportunities by being a great skater and, and to find different roles on the team. Um, not everyone can be a power play guy, but what other role can I, can I fill? Mm -hmm. And lots of times they're looking for speed guys um, to fill those other roles as well. Yeah. And I don't think, younger players understand that you get to the next level by filling that role sometimes. And then from there, like you just talked about earlier, you work on 
what do I need to do now to dominate this level? Right. You know, but you can't dominate that level unless you start working on all those other skills that are going to able to get you into a role at that level. 100%. How do I get there? What's going to keep me here long enough for them to show that I can do something else well? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's, that's certainly a challenge for young, young players to understand. Yeah, for sure. All right. I like that. Okay. So when you're looking at the NHL, a lot mm-hmm. of players coming up, um, you know, whether it, it's whether they're, you know, dr- draft picks and they're younger, you know, they're coming into camp for the first time, you know, younger players that are coming, you know, younger pro players that are coming from the AHL. Some players stick, some players don't. What do you think, you know, kind of makes that difference? I, honestly, and I, I've had the unique experience of playing in the minors, watching, watching people f- go up and down. Um, coaching in the minors, now coaching in the NHL, what makes a player stick? I think truly you have to love the process. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that it is hard, very hard. These are the best players in the world, the best athletes in the world, in my, you know, uh, my estimation, but you have to love the process. If you're a guy that gets up and is like, oh, I have to go to practice today, you don't have a chance. Mm-hmm. You have to love the process. Love the process of working hard. Love the process of getting better. And to get better, I, I honestly believe a skill that needs to be stressed is, is the ability to listen. Mm-hmm. I always say to players, you have to listen to change, change to improve. And if you can't listen, you can't improve. Mm-hmm. And so that's a big thing that we go with is, is you have to believe that your coach is right and you have to love the process of working at improving. Mm-hmm. Man, and that's – to me that hits home because, you know – it's easy to believe your coach is right when I'm listening to Pat and he's the coach of the Detroit Red Wings, right? But it's not that easy when I'm listening to, you know, Billy Bob, whose dad, he's the dad of, you know, Timmy, and he's yelling me on the bench. Right. And so, but I see what you're saying because, like, you can't blow him off and have a bad attitude towards him and then expect all of a sudden to change when you get to the next level. What he's doing is, though, he's providing direction on how to be successful on your team mm-hmm. uh, at that moment. Mm-hmm. So you certainly have to take that into consideration. He's, he's giving you direction on how to be successful for him and your team at that moment. So yep. to me, that's the most important advice you could have at that time. Yep. Um, long term, if it's, if it's right and it's wrong, at the time, it's correct. Yep. So to listen to it, to follow to the best of your direction – and there's lots of ways to coach hockey. There's lots of ways to be successful at hockey. Everyone on the same page, which means at that point, everyone listening and trying to do the same thing is a way for a team to be successful. And ultimately, as an individual, you'll be noticed uh, the more, on a more successful team for sure. Yeah. So when it comes to you, you know, like when you're actually talking about listening, I just want to kind of go on a little bit of a, a side note here because – do you notice when you're talking to players and have you worked with players like, you know, I, at least personally, I've seen this a lot at the AAA level. So now you've kind of seen the progression. Is there a difference in the progression with body language? Is there a difference in the progression with the AAA guys to the D1 guys to the NHL guys in terms of when you talk to them, you know, what's their body language like? Where are their eyes? You know, do you notice that? I mean, talk to me about that because I'm fascinated by this. It's, uh, there's not a difference in the great ones in my mind because okay. they're engaged. Yep. They're, they're, they're listeners and, and they still want to get better every single day. Um, so even the, the guys at the NHL level that are engaged, a young guy, Dylan Larkin comes up and, it, you know, I'll work with him on, on one timing shots. Uh, but he's engaged. He's listening. He's attempting to do what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, at the, at the college level, we had a great success with, with lots of defensemen signed in the National Hockey League. We changed little things about their game. Um, they're engaged in the same way. So I think great players and truly players that want to succeed are listeners and are willing to change and engage in that conversation. I think guys that, that, uh, that think they're right um, immediately or, or think they know more than the coach at that time are generally the guys that you're going to find are complaining that they got cheated by the game or that they've been wronged in some way when really they've, they've chosen their own path. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm willing to bet that, you know, if you kind of look at the question I asked earlier about, you know, 
what you see players, some players stick, some players don't, things like that. I would be willing to bet that that engagement is probably one of those intangibles that, you know, you could measure to some extent. You know? Oh, hundred percent. So I agree. Cool. I like it. I like it. Um, so I guess that kind of leads me into, you know, talking about mindset and, I always, I think this is a tough thing for, for players to grasp and for me to grasp because, um, you know, how do you communicate that? How do you communicate mindset and, and the importance of mindset? You know, where do you stand on that? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, mindset approach uh, to me is to truly be great at something, you know, you need inner drive. And mm -hmm. I, I really believe if you want to be a great, a great salesman, a great engineer, whatever you want to be. You have to have inner drive to 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 really attack that, and I think anybody who's really trying to achieve great needs a little bit of crazy in their uh, approach to what they want to do. Like if you want to play in the National Hockey League, um, then you have to chase it as hard as you possibly can, even though you probably, not possibly, probably aren't going to make it. Mm -hmm. But you have to chase it with a crazy, uh, you know, a little bit of crazy in your attitude and your approach of nothing will stop me from achieving my goal. And in, if you have that mindset, I'm going to chase it as hard as I can, uh, do the absolute best that I can, everything I can to make the National Hockey League. Again, if you don't make it, at least you can retire or stop playing with, with peace of mind. Mm -hmm. it, it's, and if you, if you don't do that, which I've certainly seen in the minors, tremendously skilled players, um, guys that should be stars in the National Hockey League that ended up only playing in the minors because they weren't willing to chase it every day or didn't have a little crazy in their game and their, their will, their desire, their approach. If you don't have that, you won't make it or you'll make it for a cup of coffee and you'll be right back down. So I think to be great at anything, you need that type of mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, I use the word obsessed a lot. Yeah. Like, you know, it can have a negative connotation to it, but like, how else do you do it? Like, you got to be just that into it, you know? 100%. Um, it's, it's a lifestyle. And that, that's, that's at anything, though. To yeah, really achieve sure. at the highest level, it's not just, oh, you're crazy. You, you love hockey. You, yeah, we do love hockey. You yeah. love hockey. I love hockey. That's how we, that's, that's why we do hockey. Mm -hmm. Um, but to be to be great at anything, you need to chase it. So, you said that you know if they if they have a little bit of that crazy, if they're obsessed, if they're going after it one hundred percent, they probably won't make it, which I agree with. But the inverse of that is that if you you know if you don't attack it like that, if you're taking some shortcuts, if you're not that obsessed, if you don't have that crazy, I mean, is the answer that you definitely won't make it? Then, like you've lost even that I, little little. I, Honestly, I think it is. And yeah. we all look over and say, oh, that guy's so talented. He's so gifted. He's meant to play hockey, and he made it. You, sh I mean, I, I had the pleasure this year of coaching uh, Pavel Dadzuk and everybody. I mean, for my money, he's the best player in the league for the last 10 years as far as overall um, you know, ability playing both mm -hmm. sides of the puck. Obviously, he's magic with the puck. But without the puck, I think he's been the best defensive forward in the league for 10 years. Mm. And – to watch him work on a daily basis, he's 37 years old, he's turning 38 this summer, Pavel isn't just talented. Pavel is, is as hard a worker as there is in the National Hockey League. And he's been that way, that I was told, since the day he stepped here in Detroit and probably before that. Mm -hmm. So the, the guys that you say are gifted or talented, they're not just gifted or talented. They are crazy hard workers. And that allows their ability, their skill, their talent to show through. Yep. If you don't have it, you don't chase it, you're not going to allow that skill to show through. And could you possibly play in the National Hockey League for a bit? But can you make a career in the National Hockey League or make a career uh, of being an elite pro player? I, I don't think you can. Mm -hmm. So just – the 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 chance I say chances are you're not going to make it because th those are th those are the real life things. But throw that out the window. Chase your dream. Mm -hmm. I chased it as hard as I possibly could. I got to play eight years of professional hockey in the minors. I don't regret one day or one second of that. Mm -hmm. I would do it all over again and give the same effort, not knowing or even if I did know. But you have to chase it 
to give yourself even a chance of playing at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, with, with Pavel, what can players take away from that? Like from the work ethic is, you know, one I'll ask you, is there any examples like, you know, real world examples of times when you've just been like, Jesus, like that guy's still here or, you know, what's he doing now? Like he's crazy. You know, how do you, is there a way that you can quantify that at all? And then the well, other thing I'm going to ask on top of that is because, you know, we all see the highlight real goals. You know, everybody wants to practice the Dezukian move because that's, you know, that's what makes him so good, right? Like that's why, you know, that's why he's Pavel Dutsuk. If he didn't have that, he wouldn't be as good as he is. Or at least that must be what people think because that seems to be the only thing they focus on. So, right. you know, talk about, is there any examples of that? And then how do you actually, you know, how, how do you take the, those things that he's doing and, and what should players take away from that? Right. And not, not to talk too much about, you know, what he does, because that's, that's some of his own stuff, but yep. two, two examples could stick out in my mind for sure. So, um, it was the middle of January, which we're 50 games into a season. Um, you know, Pavel's 37 years old. We have a day off. Um, I was the only person in there. I was doing a little extra video. I thought, Hey, I'll take a break and go grab a workout. And there's one guy in the weight room that day. Um, 37-year-old Pavel Dadzu crushing a leg workout that most people probably couldn't do in the summer on his day off in the middle of January in the middle of an NHL season. Um, amazing. You know, I just shook my head, and so that's why he's the greatest. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing, on ice, uh, Pavel's been a, a takeaway leader in the National Hockey League and wins more pucks and stick battles and has the strongest stick that, I, that I've seen. Um, and something I've always marveled at a reason why he's so good with the puck and has it so often is because he takes it away from other people so well. And they, um, at the end of every practice, they've now just call it Pav one on one. He grabs someone from the team and they play keep away, um, you know, 10 or 15 minutes at the end of practice every single day, winning stick battles, uh, making sure that that guy can't take the puck from you. And if there's, it's a loose puck, it's your puck. He just plays my puck. And um, he, th there's a reason he wins all those pucks because mm -hmm. he practices it every day relentlessly. And um, it's a thrill and a, a challenge for our young guys to face him because it's, uh, it's a study in leverage. It's a study in stick position. It's a study in, in, in how to win pucks uh, in unique ways that, that Pavel's figured out over hours and hours and hours of, what would be playing a game, but it's a game with purpose. Yeah. Hmm. And it seems to me like, you know, the way that you, like you said, the way that you figure out some of those things is because, you know, if he's repeating it over and over again, and he's spending that much time doing it. And I imagine he's not sitting there, you know, in, in my mind and, and some players mind, like you think about the one-on-one -on -one little games that players play after practice, where it's like, I'm going between your legs and then you're going between my legs. Guessing that this doesn't look much like that. It looks different. It yeah. looks different. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's truly a stick. Sometimes he won't even touch the puck, and he'll just not allow the other player not to touch the puck. Things like that. That yep. is just uh, body position, leverage, all the little things that he's working on. No, he's not going between his legs um, and doing uh, toe pulls and, and, and putting it up in the air like Pavel could easily. Yep. Um, it, it's true puck protection and true uh, battling for the puck. It's the skills that matter 99.9% .9 of the time you know, not the 0.1%, right? Like he's working on the stuff that's actually going to matter. I think, I, I forget who said it, but it, I think it might've been, uh, it was, it was a football guy though that said, you have to have the ability to work through boredom. So it's, you know, can you get, can you work on those skills that some people would say, oh, it's boring to work on. It's boring. But in reality, those are, that's the difference of greatness or not and winning or not, and maybe your place in the team or not. Mm -hmm. So, it, if you can learn again, like I said earlier, to love that process of working on all those little things, then you have a chance of success, not at just the level you're at, but the next level and, and at every level above it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And, and I just, it's such a thing that I want to stress because, you know, all the teams, all the players that I've worked with very rarely at the end of practice, one have I seen, you know, kids really getting after it. Like, it seems like they're, you know, there's no, there's nothing with that is really be done with a purpose. And that's always frustrating to see. Like, it's super frustrating 
to see there's an opportunity to get better and an opportunity to have ice time that's essentially being wasted, you know. And then the other thing is with a guy like Pavel who's got that just insane level of skill and you see these kids that are doing the one-on-one staff after practice and they're practicing those dangles and those toe pulls and, you know, he's taking the time, like you said, to work on the body positioning, the leverage. It's, it's the things that, you know, aren't flashy that he's actually working on. Oh, hundred percent. And now I'm sure he's worked on the other stuff as yeah. well during this time. But, um, and that's part of our jobs as coaches too, especially on young kids is I think inherently, especially when I was coaching midget, I believe all kids want to work hard and want to succeed. Mm-hmm. It's our job to provide that structure of how can they, how can we uh, teach them to love the process Mm-hmm. while getting better so if they have extra time and they're unproductive with it can we give them ideas suggestions thoughts without making them do it but mm-hmm. hey here's something that's fun and productive yeah um, and try to give them those thoughts of instead of just you know standing back there and taking a, a one-timer that or, i mean a, taking a slap shot that takes five seconds to get off that's grossly unrealistic can we work on one time in the puck can we work on moving and getting shots through um can you make it a game with it, with other guys in the team? Uh, things like that. It's our jobs as coaches, especially at the younger uh, levels, is to provide not necessarily exact structure, but thoughts and ideas that that help them get their thoughts going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's that's great advice. What when you, when you were coaching AAA, and you did like you said, you did have those players that you saw make that progression. They made the jump, you know, to dominate the level they were at move to the next level, dominate the level they were at, move to the next level, you know, some now playing in the NHL. Is there any similarities there that you notice between those players? Uh, Inner drive. I'm going to say that again. And and it's, but it was funny because I had great success with, uh, I'm a Minnesotan by the way, and I'm from Rochester. And so I grew up in Minnesota and I understand the, the hockey culture there. And it's hockey in Minnesota is easy. And I say that because, it's available everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's relative to the rest of the hockey world. It's, it's inexpensive. Um, your road trips are, are 20 minutes to an hour, you know, um, in lots of other places in the, you know, in the country, kids are traveling an hour to practice. They're traveling more than that to practice on a daily basis. It's harder. Um, so when I would, would get the kids from Minnesota who didn't necessarily have to work at the game yet, to love that process yet. Um, once they found out and they, they made that connection between hard work and success, hard work and improvement, then I thought, okay, once you, as a player, you make that connection, you can go to any level you want Mm -hmm. and just take that with you. And as long as you take that with you, and now I have kids that, um, you know, graduated college and, and they're successful in the business world because they've made the connection of hard work equals success. Is it in hockey at the highest level? Maybe for some people it is, mm-hmm. but it, it's going to drive you to be a successful person as soon as you can make that connection. So um, once you see that they they really get that idea of, you know, the harder I work, definitely I'm going to be better. And it it doesn't happen in a day. Mm-hmm. So they don't get to work hard for a day. They don't get to work hard for two weeks, and then go well. I'm not better yet. I don't have my scholarship yet. I've worked super hard this month. That's not how it works. For us, for the Minnesota guys, lots of times it was kids that came down. They worked all year long. Then when they went back to Minnesota at the end of the year, and all of a sudden now they made the select camps when the year before they weren't in the final 54 even. Um, They got to see, hey, wait a minute. I just put in nine months of work. And now I've made, progr- I've passed some people. I've moved forward. I've yep. made a step, not every step, but I've made a step. Now I get to, I have to continue this to make the next step or somebody else is going to pass me. Someone else is, you know, when I wor- grew up in Minnesota, I always worked out, made sure I worked out on Friday and on Saturday because mm-hmm. I knew most guys were at the lake. I went to the lake too. We had, you know, all my friends had cabins. I love skiing. I went to the, it was great. But I felt like every Friday and Saturday I worked out, I gained on someone. Mm-hmm. You know, that was my approach. I gained on someone that was better than me because they took the weekend. They left early. They went to the cabin early. Um, I think there's time for both. I think mm-hmm. there's plenty of time to work as hard as you can possibly work 
get that out of the way first and then go have your fun, uh, go ski and do hang out with your friends, do those things. But that's got to be your mentality. Mm-hmm. Work first. Yeah. That's sacrifices to some extent. Those sacrifices have to be made. I mean, like you said, there's time for both, but there's not as time, as much time as everybody else may spend on it for both. You know, you got to make those decisions and those sacrifices. hundred percent. You have, and you have to love doing it. Yeah, exactly. Find a way to love exactly. Doing it. We call it, uh, I call it breaking the chain where you see a player who puts the work in, puts the work in, puts the work in, maybe is getting frustrated, maybe, you know, isn't getting the results they want. You know, it's been a month, it's been two months, it's been six months, but then all of a sudden when it starts to click, and I think you talked about just connecting that hard work to the results, that's something that I call breaking the chain where it's like, now they know anything's possible. You know, they're kind of let loose a little bit and it's almost that much more motivating if you can get to that point, you know, um, how do you see players kind of connecting that? Like, what does it take to connect that? Is it, you know, is there something that they can be doing to, you know, one, kind of overcome the obstacles that it might take? You know, you, we talk about inner drive, but what's the connection there? Is it, is it training more hockey specific? Is it not spending your time on the wrong things? It, you know, is there anything that you can recommend that these kids are doing for that? Honestly, it's, I think the number one thing is just eliminate your own mental barriers. Mm-hmm. Don't you know? I I haven't got there yet. I haven't done this. I, I've worked hard, but I haven't achieved it. Just chase it. Yep. Just keep working. I, I don't think um, you know hockey specific. There's that's a lots of people are talking about that. I think you have to be the best athlete you can be. Mm-hmm. Um, work as hard as you can at at getting uh, better at things. You know, it, we like to call it deliberate practice. Mm-hmm. So don't attend attend to achieve, you know, deliberate practice. Am I going, it's like going to hit a, I just came from, uh, from the driving range. Did I throw a bucket of balls down and just whack them out there and, and not care where they went? Well, that that's, I mean, what, what does that do for me? Or am I trying to hit every shot? Well, so mm-hmm. deliberate practice, I'm attending practice. I'm doing, I'm lifting weights. I'm doing sprints. I'm shooting pucks. I'm not just shooting a bunch of pucks in the net. I'm trying to shoot it as hard as I can for a spot every single time, deliberately trying to do something to get better, Mm -hmm. not just attending, but trying to achieve in all those things. So I think deliberate practice is a way to, you know, the thought of, of really having something to focus on and practice toward that is going to, is going to show results certainly faster. Mm -hmm. When you say deliberate practice, did you, or do you work a lot with the players because I know you have a lot of different roles as the assistant coach, and I know there's a team of people that are there. But, you know, even when you were with other teams, do you know, how much time do you spend with the players on skills, whether it be after practice, before practice, skill sessions, um, you know, or potentially even off-ice skills as well? Well, certainly NHL level, uh, practice time is so limited. People wouldn't believe how limited it is because the schedule is so demanding. You essentially play a game every other day for six months, mm-hmm. um, 82 games in, in, in six months. So we certainly do little skill work, and but not the skill sessions like in college where we had time. Um, when we came to you know Western Michigan where I coached, uh, at the time they were one of the worst programs in the country, and I, I came with Jeff Blaschel, and, and he didn't get the job until May. And I, he hired me in June, so we didn't have time to go get a bunch of players. Uh, how are, were we going to get better that first year? And we looked at each other and said, we have to make our players that we have better. So um, I had a background in, in skills and training. And, I, and so for a half hour a day before practice started, I took the defenseman one day, forwards the next, defenseman the next, forwards the next. He had the goalies at one end. And we just did skill sessions. Um, footwork, simple as passing, all the little fundamentals that, that, uh, you know, when put together equal, you know, success or changed habits, improved habits. Um, we're, we're big habit people. So we believe if you do it right Mm -hmm. every single time, you do it right every single time, then in the game, that's the only way you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, neutral zone drills with our defensemen where they're whipping it to each other, I believe in the neutral zone, for example, the defensive, I always say they pass with their feet. So if you're not active with your feet, your pass is going to be bad. Mm-hmm. And if you're not stepping to your pass, your pass is going to be bad. So we worked on things like that 
And all of a sudden our execution in the games got better and better and better. And then people were saying, well, what are you guys doing to work on neutral zone? Well, we weren't working on neutral zone. We're working our defensive and footwork, mm -hmm. which turned into us looking like we had a great neutral zone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so those things are what we did. And, and we have less time to do that in National Hockey League, but we do try to certainly um, work in some of those things if we can. So do players, do you see players taking that kind of into their own hands at all? They do. Uh, we stay out after every single practice and they'll, it's more players come to us first. Can you work with me on this? Uh, Tony Granato was with us last year. We had, we had the benefit of having Chris Chelios around. So, um, you know, can you work with, you know, defense will grab Chris. So can you work with me, get my shots through, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's so hard to get a shot through the net anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to be creative in your ways of opening up lanes, moving your feet, being some deception up there. So, um, certainly we're lucky to have guys with, big time experience and, 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 and big time ability to, to help our players get better every day. Good. Good. Yeah. That's, uh, it seems like it's just so important. You know, it seems like it's just so important to kind to always be working and looking for that edge. No, no doubt. No doubt it is. <clears throat> With, you, you talk a little bit about getting shots through and, and, you know, I think just making plays in general, I mean, you know, what, have you noticed any ways to make plays or to score goals even, you know, at that level? I mean, what does that take? You know, I mean, there's obvious things that it takes, right? But is there any subtle things that, you know, positioning before you get to the puck, things along those lines or before the opportunity that, you know, you've noticed that you can kind of preach in terms of, you know, you know, you want to be a goal scorer and you want to be, have the transferable skills. This is the things that you need to be working on. Right. It's, it's, I mean, we can talk skill sets, but uh, it's honestly, if you want to score goals at the highest level, you have to be willing to get to the inside and go to the net. Mm -hmm. That's where they're waiting. The mm -hmm. goals are waiting at the net. And there's all kinds of pretty plays. There's all kinds of these other things. You got to be willing to go in there and get close to the net and be willing to stay there. And, and that's where they're scored. Watch the playoffs. I mean, there's, there's more rebound goals. There's more of those things. Um, uh, you know, to put yourself in position, I would say, you know, you proactively have to skate on offense, just like people, it's, they, everybody relates work and defense. Oh, he's, he's a hard worker. He's a good defensive player. He's, I think you have to work for offense as well. Mm -hmm. Proactively get, go to support the puck, um, proactively get yourself to the net, uh, and get position early. Um, so just to, like you have to work on defense, to get the puck back, I think you have to proactively work on offense to create it. And that's uh, with or without the puck. Hmm. Yeah. So true. <clears throat> so then players that come up, leading scorer in major juniors, first round pick, sec you know, second round pick, you know, leading scorer in, in college, coming into the NHL, you see it more times than not, end up on the third line, you know, if they're lucky enough to get to the league, they're ending up on the third line. Very rarely are stepping into a power play role, something like that. You know, if why is that? You know, why is that? Or, or many times they don't, you know, they don't end up in that role ever again. Right. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a, several factors there, but it's the recognition of how great those top two line players are in the National Hockey League. It's you, everyone is the best where they're at. And as the, as as literally the old you know the old pyramid expression goes, but it's correct. They're so good at the top two lines in the National Hockey League, and they're men. These aren't boys you're playing against. These are men that lives and careers are on the line, and they play like it every single day. So to be successful in the National Hockey League on the first line, second line, third line, fourth line, uh, Mike Babcock, I steal this from him. He calls him. You have to be an everydayer. You have to bring it every single day, every shift. So that's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing to do to play every other day for six months and be at your, your best or as good as you can be on that day for 82 games. Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing to do and it takes maturity. It takes uh, approach on and off the ice as far as uh, willingness to make sure you're in bed at night. Make sure you've eaten the right things. Make sure you've taken care of your body. Uh, it's a whole combination of mature factors that young guys haven't all haven't mastered yet. 
lots of times. So they come up. There are lots of times they'll look good for the first two, three, four games, but it's so hard to sustain. Hard to be an everydayer when you're being leaned on physically every day. Hard to be an everydayer when I'm used to 20 minutes of ice time and I only get 12, and I look at the coach and say, well, I'd be better with 20. And he says, well, I want to keep my job. You get 12 because that's what you've earned. Mm-hmm. You know, um, So, it, it, again, Mike Babcock said to me one time, he said, young guys – they don't know. They still think that I'm in charge of their ice time. They don't realize that they're in charge of their ice time. Mm-hmm. So to me, I'm, I think he's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Yet players are in charge of their own ice time. And if they do it right every single time, again, it might not result that game, but you do it right more than the next guy. And sooner or later, maybe it's a week, maybe it's three weeks, maybe it's two months, you get to take his ice time. And that's how it works. It's a slow process sometimes. It's a faster process sometimes. But the idea of, of being repeatable and being an everydayer is what most young guys struggle with when they come in the league. Hmm. <laughs> oh, it's a good message. Uh, hope, I hope that hits home with a lot of, uh, a lot of players. But uh, just a couple more questions here. What With hockey sense – Hockey sense is something that a lot of, you know, coaches believe, you know, can't be improved. Like you either have it or you don't, um, you know, hockey sense can be attributed to a lot of things, positioning, things along those lines, just, you know, ability to anticipate plays, you know, what do you consider hockey sense? And, and, you know, do you think that a player can develop their hockey sense? Can they improve in hockey sense? Or do you think they have to find a role where, you know, you, you are what you are, and you have to be able to be, have success in this role. Right. I, I think the – to me, I define hockey sense as just good decision makers, right? Mm-hmm. The guy's, oh, he's smart. He's got great hockey sense. To me, that just means he's making correct decisions over and over and over again. Well, then it's our jobs as coaches is to put them in as many of those situations on a repeated basis as we can so they're – constantly making the right decisions they see those things over and over and we work on we have the simplest drills um even in the national hockey league we have simple drills we had simple drills in the american hockey league we have simple drills at division one level and they're all meant to build habits and i think they have the habit of making the right decision that, because we've put them in those spots um over and over again and now it looks the same to them so it's not, they're not caught in a first time. Uh, I haven't seen this before. They know I'm here. I get pressure from here. The puck goes there. I get pressure from here. The puck goes there. Is that hockey sense? Or have we built a habit of making the right decision? I think coaches take the easy way out sometimes and say, can't build hockey sense. Of course you can. It's, it's repeated correct decisions is hockey sense in my opinion. And maybe other people will disagree, but So can we build on that? Yes. Let's put them in positions that we see routinely on the ice and teach them how to make the correct decision. If the pressure comes from here, the puck goes there. If it comes from the inside, it goes to the outside. Or I'm supporting it in this way when he's in trouble. These things are all things that we can can recreate as coaches um, and help our players make correct decisions. Hmm. Okay. I agree with all of that. What – what about you have a player, 14, 15, 16, 17, they're not getting that type of coaching. Yeah. What can they do to then improve and, and, and start to put themselves in certain situations, start to learn certain situations, and kind of simulate that process as if you, know, you did have a coach that was working on those things? In my mind, be a student of the game. Watch the game. It, watch a National Hockey League game as much as possible. All it does, it repeats itself from one end to the other to the other. It's just a, it's a repeated thing. Happens, the, the game, they break it out. They break it out one of three to four ways. It goes down the other end, they're stopped. Uh, they break it out the exact one of four ways. It comes down the other end, and until someone makes a mistake and they take advantage of it. So if hockey sense, you see guys uh, drive down the wall and they pull up, uh, and they, they make decisions from there. Pick out a favorite player, somebody you want to emulate, study him, watch him. Mm-hmm. What does he do repeatedly that brings him success? Can mm-hmm. I emulate some of that? Um, or can I start to understand 
uh, Patrick Kane is, is one of the best at buying space and creating space. And, and um, while not necessarily a super, super fast player, a very good skater, and he uses deception and ability to buy space, but maybe better than anyone in the league. How can I maybe not be Pat Kane, but take some of that mm -hmm. into my own game? Um, when he pulls up and he finds late players, when he's being pressured off, he doesn't continue to get himself squeezed off. He pulls up and buys a little space and time for himself. So um, if you're not directly getting the coaching, there's great examples on TV every night right now. Go watch. Pick a guy or pick two guys or pick one guy on each team and watch him and then see what he does repeatedly that you like and try to emulate it. Mm -hmm. That's good. <clears throat> Last question I have here. I think you've, you've, you've mentioned this a few different times in, in different ways, and, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, one thing that a player can actually work on that's going to give them the best chance of making the NHL? Skating. I have to go back to it. I, I honestly, I believe the, the, the number one limiting factor to any next level from where you're at to the next level, and certainly in the National Hockey League, is skating. Mm -hmm. um, great skaters are going to give themselves an opportunity for lots of different roles. Um, not great skaters are going to have limited roles, and then there's even more limited spots. The spots are already limited the way they are. Give yourself a chance by being the best skater you can be, and then a lot that which allows some of your other skills to show. Hmm. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is um, D1 Bound Hockey, which I know you've put together with, with a couple different players. Uh, or a couple of different coaches and people. Sean Podine was one of them. Um, talked a little bit about what that is, and uh, you know what what type of what type of program it is, and, and essentially who it's for, and why a player should go. Well, D one Bound is a uh, you know, as a Minnesota guy who, who loves Minnesota. I didn't get the chance to play. I played at Western Michigan University, but I love the the universities in, in Minnesota. And I mm -hmm. think um, you know, as a young player, I didn't have exposure to them like I, like I wanted when I was coming up through. So number one, how do I know where to go? Um, how do I know what, what one, what college I even like? Um, how do I know, how do I get in touch with division one coaches? Um, and so division one D one bound is something that, that Sean and I put together this year. It involves university of Minnesota, university of Duluth and university uh, St. Cloud university. So, uh, um, a kid can come and he, he stays the night at the University of Minnesota. He wakes up in the morning. He practices with four Division I coaches, um, gets a tour of campus, uh, gets some talk about um, maybe at the University of Minnesota, it's um, rules on recruiting for NCA. So now I understand, hey, I'm not getting called every day. Um, well, I can only get called once a month. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, little things um, through the recruiting process that they can learn. I can contact Division I coaches long before they can contact me. So should I do that? Things we can help kids out of, of understanding the recruiting process and, and getting them on these campuses. Then you drive that night, you go to Duluth, you stay over the night, you repeat the process for different division one coaches practice with them. So um, each of these division one coaches may stress a, a different skill on the ice, a different thing, a different way of hearing things. Um, so you get to see them, you get to see Duluth's campus. Then the, you'll, you'll play a game each afternoon against a different team. You'll go to uh, St. Cloud that night. You'll wake up. You'll, you'll get four di other Division One coaches. So D1 Bound is going to expose you to uh, 12 Division One coaches, three practices with Division One coaches, see things that they think are important um, that you can maybe take back to your game. And it's also going to give you exposure to um, their campuses, uh, them as people, uh, who do I like as a staff, uh, what campus do I find intriguing to myself, um, do I like a bigger campus? Am I more intrigued by a smaller campus? These kind of things. So I think it's a great exposure that way for the and for the player, and um, and certainly gives twelve Division One coaches a free look at at you as a player um, because once you're on campus, they they get uh, more access to you than when they're, when you're not on campus for sure. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I I thought it was interesting when I was first learning about it, <clears throat> the fact that you're actually on the ice with the coaches. Yeah. You know, no, I, 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 I just don't think it really unique with the exception of the, uh, development camps in, in, uh, New York. I don't know where else you can do that. Yeah. So I thought that was a, it was a great opportunity. And, um, 
it's a great opportunity for you to let the, the, the coaches know what kind of personality you have as a player mm-hmm. and for them to learn about you. Um, they may be interested in you already as a player. Uh, they may have seen you play already as a player. Now they're going to say, is he a kid who listens? Does he work hard? Is he a kid that I want to continue to recruit? Because he's got some of those attributes that I think are important for successful teams. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, is it for both boys and girls? Boys and girls okay. um, on different weeks. Uh, the you know the, the girls are in August and the boys will be in in July. Um, so we're we're pretty excited to be able to offer both those. And um, you know, the girls hockey in Minnesota has obviously exploded and is a is a great thing right now. And and uh, so we're we're excited to give them uh, exposure to those great programs. Great. What is the main age groups of the kids that should, you know, consider signing up for this? What is the age? And then, um, you know, what, how, do, how do they get signed up or how do they learn more? Uh, they, they can go on the internet, uh, D1 Bound Hockey, and it's on our website. Um, the age groups are, the, are Bantam and up. So okay. uh, Bantams will be separated. And then the midget slash high school age groups. Um, again, we'll break them into, into two as far as like first two years of, of midget or, or high school and then second two years that way. So as much as possible, you're playing within your age group against players that should be should look like you and should give you a good challenge so we can really show um, players' abilities and skills against uh, similar players. Great. It's, it's definitely something that I think is you know unique from what I've seen out there right now. Um, I recommend players check it out. And, and the the URL, it's I believe it's d1boundhockey.com, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. I'm going to link that up also below the video so any players that are interested could just check that out right there. Um, you know, if they have any questions or anything like that, I've been to the website. It looks like you guys have, you know, pretty good information, pretty good details on the website. Um, Pat, I can't thank you enough, man. Like, I just think that – um, you know, your willingness to come here and spend some time with us, uh, you know, there's, this is going to change the directory trajectory for some players for sure, without a doubt. I know that for a fact. And so, uh, I appreciate your time. Well, good. Thanks Zach. And good luck to uh, all the young players out there. Yeah. Thanks a lot.